Welcome to Knowledgeable Aging. I'm your host, Jason Kotar. Joining us today to talk about get control of your care is Dr. Irina Koifman. Dr. Koifman is a nurse practitioner and a doctor of nursing practice with more than 20 years of clinical experience. She is a subject matter expert in care coordination, chronic care management, and a dementia care specialist. She is a nursing professor at International College of Health Science and a consultant. Dr. Koifman is passionate about patient care and her mission is to empower patients and caregivers to take control and become a quarterback of their health. The presented content does not provide or constitute medical, financial, or legal advice. The content is for information purposes only. Viewing or listening to the content does not constitute a physician-patient, dentist-patient, fiduciary client, or attorney-client relationship. How are you doing today, Dr. Koifman? I'm doing great, Jason, thank you. And I'm er very honored to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Before we get started, Dr. Koifman, for those that are joining us for the live webinar, if you have any questions, type your questions in. Time permitting, we will do everything in our power to get your questions answered. So Dr. Koifman, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Get control of your care. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'm very passionate about patients understanding that it is in their power to take control of, your, of their care and not to be always reliant on their doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants to know everything there is to know about their care. And I will explain why, but first, Jason, let me ask you a few questions. And it's not a test or a quiz, so don't, be, don't worry to, um, if you're gonna pass or not, but do you know how many seniors have at least one chronic condition? Oh, no, that's multiple, I'm sure. Okay. So according to the National Council on Aging, about 80%, eight out of every 10 elderly individuals have at least one chronic condition. Wow. And wow. 70 to 77% have at least two chronic conditions. So think about it next time you're going to see anybody age 65 and over, you can assume that that person has at least one and possibly two chronic conditions. One in four older adults experience also some mental disorders like depression and anxiety and dementia. And this number is expected to double to 15 million by the year 2030. The problem, Jason, is two thirds of older adults with mental health problems do not receive the treatments they need because current preventative services for this population is extremely limited. And I will help you and every listener on the line to learn how to get treated, tested, and, and care for. How many medications, Jason, do you think average senior takes? No idea. <laughs> you don't know. So people that are 65 to 69 years take on average 14 prescription medications per year. People that are 80 to 84 year olds take about 18 prescriptions per year. Let me break this down to you. What it means is that out of let's say 14 prescriptions per year, some might be for acute things like sinusitis, person could have had a um, ear infection. So something that's one time deal, you take it for a week and you're done. But majority of the medications are for chronic conditions, which means that they are taken daily but more importantly, some medications are taken twice a day or three times a day. Some medications need to be taken before food, so first thing in the morning. Some need to be taken with food and some after. So now think about your average elderly adult with two or more chronic conditions on about 14 medications per day. And the medication need to be stacked two before breakfast, one with food, two after lunch, some as needed. So this is a puzzle that is very hard to keep track of. And therefore, again, I will help our elderly patients and their caregivers how to um, help themselves. But I don't know if you knew, Jason, but 70%, up to 70% of every hospital admissions is caused by medication not adherence. Non-compliance is if I were to tell you, Jason, you need to take daily aspirin for your, to prevent your um, cardiac disease. And you look at me and you'll say, absolutely not. I know that I need it, but I don't want to take it. That's non-compliance. Yep. Not adherence is you will think, wow, if one baby aspirin can help to prevent my cardiac disease, maybe if I'll take two, it will work better. 
Or you might think, well, I don't have, hypothetically, the aspirin is $200. And I don't have that much money this next month. So maybe if I'll cut that medication in half and take half this month, half next month, it would be okay. So not adherence and simply not understanding the directions and instructions is not taking medications as prescribed and or just taking too much or too little. So up to 70% of hospital admissions happen for medication not adherence. So taking more than five medications per day, it's called polypharmacy. It's a medical term. Poly means many, pharmacy means medications. The risk of harmful effect or drug interactions or hospitalizations increases dramatically when the numbers of medications increase. Meaning that there are some medications that cause, let's say, dizziness. Dizziness at times cause falls, and falls at times cause um, not only bruises, but also hip fractures. I remember when I was a brand new nurse 20 some years ago in a hospital, and we had an elderly patient with a hip fracture, my friend's nurses said, oh, this is a kiss, kiss of death. I had no idea what they meant, but kiss of death means fracture, hip fracture in elderly because elderly patients with diabetes, cardiac diseases are at increased risk of mortality, meaning dying early if they get a hip fracture. So now that I hope I showcase a little bit about the difficulty that our patients have, we can talk about the difficulty that our primary care providers, our doctors, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants have. But the average time the doctor spends, when I'm talking doctor, I'm saying, you know, it could be nurse practitioner, physician assistant, or what we'll call it your primary care provider. The average time your primary care provider spends with the patient is less than 15 minutes. Actually, um, the Medscape Physician Comparison Report of 2016 said that most physicians spend between 13 and 16 minutes with each patient. Now, if they spend 13 to 16 minutes with each patient and average primary care provider spends about 16 minutes and 14 seconds using electronic medical records to document your visit, well, let's think about that. Does it mean that majority of your visit is spent when the doctor is glued to his computer and not looking you eye to eye and examining you? Probably not. So what it means is your primary care provider spends some of the time, majority of that 15 minutes, talking to you, touching you, examining you, um, having conversation, but then they have to spend that amount of time documenting it. So, I remember when I worked in a hospital as a nurse practitioner, I would, I would want to come home and have dinner with my family, but then I would spend hours documenting all of my, my notes because I wanted to see my patients face to face. I would take my notes and then spend hours at night documenting it. The average panel size of primary care provider, Jason, is about 2,500 patients. Why do you care and what does it mean? It means that if I am your doctor and I have 2,500 patients in my panel, for me to see you once a year, so every one of my patients once a year would mean that I would have to see 10 patients a day, five days a week, no, um, no vacations, no stopping. So 52 weeks of the year, I would have to see 10 patients a day. But what do we know about our, our elderly populations? They have chronic conditions. They are on multiple medications. They're being seen sometimes every two months, every three months, if they're lucky and very chronically stable twice a year. So now take the 10 patients that I would have to see once, once to see everybody once a year and multiply that by two or three. So your regular primary care provider is seeing 20 to 30 patients a day and so when we as patients think that, wait a second, I've been seeing Dr. Johnson for the past 11 years, every three, month, every three months, Dr. Johnson needs to know everything about me. It doesn't happen because Dr. Johnson has 2,499 patients just like you. So why am I saying that? It is because as patients and as caregivers, we need to learn to take care of our own care and not 
think that the doctor who I've been seeing for so long should know everything and, and understand everything and be on top of everything. Another thing that is concerning is that um, now, thank God, you know, it's like a blessing and a curse that everybody's using electronic medical records. But a primary provider who is a solo provider may have an electronic medical record A. A hospital where I see my cardiologist can have an electronic medical record named B. And a rheumatologist that I see in a big private practice somewhere else may be using electronic medical record name C. They do not talk to each other. They don't communicate. So just because everybody's in their computers and documenting things, you should not expect that just because everybody's using electronic medical record, that your primary care provider, who should be quarterback of your care, has all of the records and is able to see everything. So why am I saying that? It's because it's important for you as a patient and or caregiver as a patient to take control of your care. And before I'll tell you what you need to do, I just wanted to bring one more fact um, to maybe sympathize, for you to sympathize with your primary care providers. But um, there was a calculation done by Duke University researchers when they looked at um, how much time per day would a primary care physician spend providing all recommended acute, chronic, and preventative care for a panel? So not for one patient, but for a panel of that 2,500 patients. So preventative, Jason, is making sure that you, according to your age, receives necessary vaccines, that according to your age, you're getting recommendation for necessary um, um, procedures like colonoscopies, uh, mammograms and pap, scare, uh, pap smears for women, your eye exams, those are called preventative care. Chronic care, I think it's, you know, self-explanatory uh, is all of the chronic diseases. So making sure that your diabetes is in, uh, in, in, you know, check. And if you're chronically, if you're a patient with diabetes, for example, Part of your preventative care is making sure that you are, you know, your feet are being checked and sometimes sending you to a podiatrist, your eyes are being checked, sending you to a optometrist or ophthalmologist. You know, so there is a lot to go in with chronic conditions and not just making sure that you take your medications. And of course, acute, something that happened to you, you fell or you have an ear infection or um, you have a pain somewhere. So for a doctor, to be able to do all of the acute chronic and preventative care for a panel that's required, 17 hours every day, seven days a week without any breaks. So think about now, for a second, think about that primary care provider with an average panel of 2,500 patients. In order for that provider to do everything that needs to be done to help you, to keep you healthy and happy, they would have to work 17 hours every day. It's just not fair. So what can we do? We can go to the next slide and we can help our patients help themselves. Number one, when you are prepared to go to see your doctor's appointment, or uh, to see your doctor at the appointment, bring your personal health records. PHR, personal health records, is so important that I'll talk about it on the next slide exclusively. Next, you have to bring all of your medications, including over-the-counter medications. So I don't know if you knew, Jason, but some of the dietary supplements may increase effect of your medications. Some dietary supplements may decrease effects of your medications, which means that by taking dietary supplement that's over-the-counter, you may potentially take too much or too little of the medications that you need. For example, some of the medications for HIV AIDS, heart disease, depression, even organ transplant medications and birth control pill are less effective when taken with St. John's wort. I'm sure you heard many people are taking St. John's wort, which means that if they take St. John's wort and maybe the medication for depression or heart disease, that their results of the medication could be very different. In addition, um, many people that maybe have stroke or are, have atrial fibrillation are on blood thinner medications like Coumadin. So I don't know how many people know, but Coumadin, um, aspirin, vitamin E, and ginkgo globa, 
a lot of people are taking ginkgo biloba, are all uh, thin the blood. So if patient is taking Coumadin, and let's say they decided to take ginkgo biloba, their risk for bleeding increases a lot. So make sure that with your medication list, you, you write all of your over-the-counter medications. Next is you should keep and bring the log of your, um, of your blood pressure, your blood sugars, your weight, your diet, your emotional inventory, which we'll talk again on the next slide. But let me tell you why this is important. I can't tell you amount of patients that I had in office that had what's called the white coat syndrome. Their blood pressure in the office is 160 over 100, and they swear that their blood pressure at home is always 120 over 80. Well, now think about that as a doctor that needs to treat your blood pressure, wants to believe you, but the, the fact is the results are right here in front of my eyes. Your blood pressure is 160 over 100. If you bring the log and say, but look, doc, in the past month, this was my blood pressure, you know, in the morning, in the evening, then you're not forcing your doctor to write your prescription. And that can actually say, you know, white cone syndrome. And they might have you sit and talk to them for a long time and for a while and then retake your blood pressure. So bring the log. Blood sugars. I can't stress the importance of blood sugars. People's blood sugars fluctuate enormously before meal, after meal, at night. Help your doctor help you. Bring your blood pressure logs and make sure that you take your blood pressure reading. Maybe, you know, I, I don't want anybody to stick their finger five times a day, every day. So I tell patients, you know, do a schedule. On Monday, I'll take my blood pressure, my blood sugars um, in the morning before breakfast. On Tuesday, I'll try it after lunch. On Wednesday, I'll do before I go to sleep. On Thursday, I'll repeat it. And, and again, remember, this is for chronic patients who are diabetes is pretty well controlled, not for brittle diabetics. Brittle diabetics need to check their blood sugar a lot more often. But if you bring the log, you might show your doctor that, wow, I see that you're really spiking um, before dinner. I have to adjust your medications. Or you're really bottoming down in the morning, which is okay now, but you know, a few more months and you might actually lose consciousness. So bring the logs, keep them and bring them. And again, that could be part of your uh, medical health record as well. Bring and keep your questions. I can't tell you how many times, Jason, I get a call from my friends, from their parents, from their grandparents. They know that I'm a nurse practitioner and they say, Irina, I just saw my doctor this morning and I forgot to ask A, B, or C. Or my doctor prescribed this medication for me and can you please explain to me why? Well, it's not fair not only to me, because I have no idea, you know, all the history and what happened, but it's not fair to your primary care provider who thinks that they were very clear and you left knowing everything that needs to be done. And it's not fair to the patient because what if I'll tell you something that's different, right? So keep your questions, keep that log. And, you know, anytime, let's say, you know, you're, um, you know, it's just something that you might ask your significant other. You might say, um, I'm not sure why I'm still on two blood pressure medication. I started eating better and I started exercising and my blood pressure has been 120 over 80 in the past month. Well, ask that question to your doctor. They might be able to take you off one of the medications. So very, very important to be prepared for the appointment by having your questions. Um, tell your doctor, uh, oh, I'm sorry, bring a caregiver. Caregiver is very important and what I, encourage people to do is pick one person and stick with that person. You don't wanna bring a sister to primary care doctor, brother to cardiologist, niece to rheumatologist. It, it becomes even more fragmented than it should be. Find a caregiver that you can bring to many of your appointments, if not all. That person can keep your questions together, can take the notes for you, can be your advocate. Um, and, and that person, and I can always, you know, I always say two eyes and ears are great, but four is better. What you hear, Jason, might be very different from what I hear, right? So sometimes having two people and kind of comparing the notes, it's very helpful. Next is, um, if you don't understand, ask for clarification. I mean, truly, you have to, you can't leave the room and then call the doctor two hours later and say, doc, I, I, I need to, like, I know you told me that I need to take this medication or increase my dose, but can you tell me why? It, it's not fair because remember, they're already working, what? 17 hours a day if they were to do everything. 
So you have this time for your doctor. Ask for any clarification, that is your time. Ask for written materials. You'll be surprised how many brochures are in doctor's offices and they just don't think about it. So they gave you new medication, ask, do you have a brochure or any documentation on it? They might told you to, um, you know, diet and exercise, ask for documentation, something that you can go home, read later and really absorb the information and always have it for your records. Don't be embarrassed to bring up financial um, issues. If you have financial issues, um, and even if you don't have financial issues, ask for case manager. Case manager um, are also called patient navigator, care coordinators, they could be social workers, they could be nurses. Again, you'll be surprised how many offices that are maybe enrolled in what's called patient center medical home programs have a dedicated person who can help you in coordinating your care, finding cheaper medication options, making sure that all of your preventative measures are done. So ask for case manager. And I'll talk a little bit about how to get case manager later, but I do wanna say um, that it's very important to not be embarrassed to bring up financial issues. Um, really some patients think that doctors can fix or help with anything, you know, if you have trouble paying for, for your medications, but you will be surprised. I, I had a patient who changed prescription um, drug medication, um, drug uh, insurance, and her mm -hmm. had their asthma medication went from like $40 to $400, and she was too embarrassed to call the office or say anything, and you know what happened? She got hospitalized three weeks later for asthma exacerbation where we could have written for another medication, um, the same class, different name, a different class. We could have called the insurance company and asked what, you know, what the other options. So please don't assume that if you have a financial issues that your doctor cannot do anything about it. A lot of times they can. So on the next slide, I really wanna help you understand the importance of my health record, my personal health record. Um, on my website, I have a personal health record that you can download and use. Um, literally, you can Google and just say personal health record and you'll find tons of different forms. And Jason, before doing, doing prep for this webinar, um, I, I mostly recommend people to use Microsoft Health Vault, which is a free, was great uh, personal health record online. Well, you know, what I've learned is that they're no longer operating the Health Vault. So even Microsoft sees the operation of personal health records, and I'm guessing because there's no money in it. Nobody can make any money in it. So as much as I wanted to recommend some sort of software and they do exist and some of them are free, I am kind of back to like old fashioned paper and pencil. I do have it in Excel spreadsheet where you can just you know change it as, as you go. But um, I also think when I had, um, health vault for myself. I had to have an app on my phone. But what if, I mean, God forbid it's a crash, a car crash. Like who's going to get my, you know, phone and get my app? So having a paper in your purse, in your car, I think it's probably, although I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm a dinosaur, but it's probably still the best way of having a personal health record. What should a personal health record have? It should absolutely, no questions asked, should have your um, allergies to medications and all of your medications, including over-the-counter. Again, I'm thinking about this um, often, and I'm hoping that I'm not being more, uh, morbid, but if you're in a car crash and you can't talk and you're being ex um, transported to emergency room, number one, they wanna know what allergies do you have to your medications and what medications are you taking? So if anything, just fill that out. Um, it's very important to have all of your chronic conditions because again, they wanna know, do you have a heart disease? Do you have diabetes? It, your treatment is gonna be very different. Um, it should have your surgical history, your preventative care. And again, some of them are more important than others, but in terms of your preventative care, like your immunization, your pap smears, your colonoscopy, you fill this out once and it's pretty much done. You only update it, what, maybe once a year if you get another flu vaccine. So it's not um, time consuming nor difficult. Um, so personal health record, I'm a huge advocate. Please have it. Everybody should have it. Jason, I hope you're going to get one for you and your wife. It doesn't matter. You can be young and healthy, but you might have a um, penicillin allergy, and that could be detrimental if you get into a car crash and, and you know now you're transported to the hospital and they want to give you penicillin. Yep. 
So patient health questionnaire, it's also called PHQ-9. It's a depression screening. It's something that a person can do themselves. Um, it's a self, uh, um, self-served kind of questionnaire where at the end, it kind of gives you the, the scores and it shows you whether or not you might have depression and what stage, mild, moderate, severe. So I wanna caution everybody and say, I am not advocating for you to self-diagnose yourself. This should never be used for a person to do the questionnaire and say, okay, I'm depressed, like this is it. But this is really should help your primary care doctor. If you come to the office prepared with your questions and your health records, and you show your doctor that your PHQ-9, your patient health questionnaire was positive, and your number is 11, it opens the door for a conversation. How many people get underdiagnosed and undertreated because they, are, they don't have time or they're too proud or they just don't want to talk about their symptoms? And if you come in every time for acute issues like, oh, my diabetes is not under control, um, I have a sinusitis, your doctor is not going to slow down, spend time and say, well, let me do a patient health questionnaire on you, Jason. I want to see if you're depressed, right? Um, unless you're coming in for your annual physical or you're coming in for that problem. Some people do make an appointment and say, I feel depressed. So, but most of the time it doesn't get diagnosed. So fill out the form, bring it to your doctor. Same goes with anxiety questionnaire. And by the way, all of those forms are on my website free. You can just download them and use them. But you know, some people have anxiety and not depression. So this is an anxiety questionnaire. It's called GAD7. There are seven questions. Same thing. Fill it out, bring it to your doctor. Fill out depression and anxiety questionnaire. Look at the numbers. Call your doctor, make an appointment. Say, I want to talk to you about results of the, the, the um, screening that I've done. And then, you know, again, opens the door for conversation. It doesn't mean you're going to get medications right away. It doesn't mean you're going to get diagnosed right away. And hopefully not, because we all go through, you know, different things in our lives and, and uh, filling out the form does not really diagnose you, but it opens the door for conversations. And Jason, I know you've done a lot of webinars on advanced directives. I'm not going to take too much of everybody's time. I just want to tell you that I'm so passionate about everybody having advanced directives making sure that your doctor has a copy of it, making sure mm -hmm. that your proxy, person who you pick as your decision maker knows and understands what needs to be done. I can't tell you how many times somebody will tell me, I filled out my advanced directive. Um, and I'll say, great, who is your healthcare proxy? And they'll say, my husband. And I said, great, does your husband know your wishes? No, we didn't talk about it yet. Well, how is your husband going to try and make a decision on your behalf when you are incapa incapa incapacitated? Oh my goodness, I can't speak. Uh, but you know, when you're unable to speak for yourself, yeah. if he or she doesn't know. So please, you know, make sure that filling out the form is, is kind of like, for me, it's not ABC. It's not one, two, and three. It's one A and making sure your proxy knows it's one B. So it's almost the same, you know, make sure that people know what your wishes are. And Jason, I can tell you, I've just, I've done my advanced directives not too long ago and I'm fairly young and, 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 you know, healthy, but I know for sure what my wishes are. I don't want to be in vegetative state. I don't want to be hooked to machines. I want everything to be done for me when it's possible. But once the decision is made that there's no, no more hope, I don't want anything else. And I'm not saying that my decision is right or wrong, uh, but my decision might differ from somebody at exactly my age who might say, I want everything to be done and I wanna be in that stage for as long as I can because maybe the cure is gonna come in two or three years. It's not to say who's right, there's no right and wrong. It's just make sure that you think about it, make sure that you fill it out, make sure that your healthcare proxy understand and knows your wishes and make sure that your doctor has a copy of it. Like you said, have the conversation, right? Have a conversation. It's it's one of the most important things that anybody can do. And um, the next slide, I'll just talk a little bit about who should be involved in your care. Um, your primary care provider. I think I started this talk by saying that I believe that you as a patient is the quarterback of your care, not your doctor, not anybody else. But when we are talking about your your healthcare group, your primary care provider, your specialist, your physical therapist, your home health aide, your primary care provider should always be that quarterback. Because let's say if you have um, uncontrolled diabetes and you're seeing endocrinologists every month 
and your endocrinologist becomes almost like your family member because they call you and they want to know everything there's going on, but your blood pressure is elevated, they're not going to treat your hypertension. So your primary care provider needs to get all of the notes, need to understand what's happening, and primary care provider is the one who sees you as a whole picture, as a whole person. It's all patient-centered care, where a specialist only sees you as a diabetic or your heart or your liver, you know, whatever specialty you are um, going to see the most. Care coordinator uh, or patient advocate, um, as I said, doctor's offices that are um, enrolled in what's called patient center medical home programs, they get more money from their health insurances, have the care coordinators um, or patient advocates. I also always encourage people to call their, their insurance company. So let's say everybody have Medicare and many people have secondary insurance. Secondary insurances like AARP, United, uh, Aetna, they most likely have um, case manager through the insurance company. So don't think because they're secondary, they won't talk to you, they will. Um, also specialists obviously should be involved in your care, but I wanted to tell people, don't think of specialists also, like I told you, like, oh, this is just my endocrinologist, they treat my diabetes. When you see your specialist next time, you have to say, hey, my endocrinologist, my blood pressure was increased and now I'm, I'm taking you know, yet another medication. They need to know all that because it changes your overall patient picture. Um, so they need to be involved in your overall care. And of course your caregiver. I can't stress enough, I said that before, but find one person, teach that person, bring that person with you. And what's also important, if that person cannot come to your next doctor's appointment, it's fine, but bring all that information back to the person and tell them everything that happened to you. So now they're up to date. So they're not having questions and they don't have to call your doctor. And you know, while it's fresh in your head, make sure that the communication is always two way. And um, I think I was able to showcase kind of the, the difficulties that our elderly patients have with multiple conditions, multiple medications. Um, I hope that I was able to um, enlist a sympathy to our primary care providers who work um, just, I, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna say crazy hours and, and they do everything they can to keep every patient healthy. But seeing that picture, you as a patient need to recognize and realize that only you and truly you should be the quarterback of your care. And you should have all the tools necessary to help yourself and stop relying on your doctors and primary care providers for everything because things will ultimately fall through the crack, things are gonna be missed and things are not gonna be maybe as you want them to be. So you need to learn how to take care of your own care and be your own patient advocate. Wonderful stuff, Dr. Koifman. Uh, we've got a couple questions. Um, the first question is, how can I guarantee that um, my primary care, my oncologist, et cetera, that they're on the same team when it comes to, like you said, one of them could have, you know, one idea what's going on. The one has another one. They don't, their medical records aren't speaking to each other. How yeah. can I guarantee that that happens? So there is no guarantee, unfortunately. And I hate to be so blunt, but, but you, can't, you can't guarantee you can help. How you okay. can help is you can try to facilitate a case conference so try to get your primary care provider when you may be in their office to call your oncologist and have that conversation. Um, also, um, huge help by these healthcare professionals who are called patient advocates or case managers who, because of the HIPAA regulations, they are allowed to get all the records from primary care and oncologist and at least you know, make sure that they get exchanged and that one person can know kind of be that person who knows everything that's happening to you, but it's all up to you. Keep your medic health medical records, bring information back and forth. I think the only way you can truly help is to understand that they're most likely not talking to, to each other. So it's up to you to facilitate that communication. Yeah. Next question, Dr. Koifman, is our case managers typically covered by insurance? So typically, yes. Yes, okay. there are case managers that you can get fee for service, pay cash. They're wonderful people and I love them, but I'm the kind of person that unless I exhaust all of my free options, I'm not gonna pay for something that I could possibly get for free. So again, number one, ask your doctor's office, ask your specialist, they might have it. 
call your insurance agent, insurance provider. They all have case managers. Ask to, to be contacted by case manager and talk to them. And the other thing, Jason, is there are tons of, well, maybe not tons, but there are quite a few nonprofit organizations that provide free um, patient care advocate or navigator or care coordinator. Um, and it's just up to you as a patient to um, search them, Google them, you know, call them and see some of them are completely free. Some are kind of need based. If you have money, they might ask you to pay something, but we call them. And another thing um, also, for example, if somebody has dementia, like Alzheimer's Association has a lot of free um, resources, including, you know, patient navigator, diabetic association. So look also at your kind of diseases association and see what help they have. So I would do that before I would pay anybody. Yeah, and then actually the last question was about is if I'm looking for that advocate, how do I find mm -hmm. them? But you, you just answered that question. So that was wonderful. So Dr. Koifman, how can people find you? So I, um, I have a consulting um, firm. Um, it's called Affinity Expert. So my website is www.affinityexpert.com. And my email is irena at affinityexpert.com. I will be more than happy to entertain any questions, answer any questions. Um, you can also find me uh, on Facebook and, and um, Instagram and Twitter. And I'm very active in chronic care management um, groups. So I'm, I love to help people, empower them to get better care of themselves. So I'm very... Um, I'll be honored if you ask me any questions and I'll hope that I'll be able to answer. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. So as far as Knowledgeable Aging, you can find our archive webinars on our uh, homepage, uh, knowledgeableaging.com. You can also go to our YouTube page, type in Knowledgeable Aging. We encourage you to subscribe. We update that four to five times per week. If podcasts are your thing, you can find us on Apple Tunes, Spotify, et cetera. Until next time, I'm your host, Jason Kotar, and this is Knowledgeable Aging. <laughs>